Hi there. Please listen to the following story and then gather a few friends in your home, tell them the story and generate a bit of discussion at the end. I'd like to tell you the story of God and his relationship with human beings throughout the whole Bible and especially a word called covenant, which God uses to describe his idea of relationships. So the Bible starts with God alone and he says, let us make man in our image. And he's talking amongst himself, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit are talking together and saying, let us make man in our image. Right there in the Godhead, God is three, but he is one. There is relationship, there is unity, love, a singleness of purpose in the Trinity of God. And God says, let us make man in our image so that he has that unity in relationship. And he makes Adam the first man. And then God says, it is not good for man to be alone. God wanted Adam to understand how God's heart was feeling. Adam was created, but he didn't have a companion, a friend, somebody who he could share his life with. And God wanted Adam to feel that. And then God made Eve, the woman, out of Adam. He took something out of Adam and made Eve and the two became one flesh. They were united. The Bible says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife. And that's talking about this covenant idea. And then the two will become one flesh, which means husband and wife marriage relationship. And this whole idea is a picture, the Bible says, of God wanting a relationship with us, his people. Right throughout the Bible, from beginning to end, there is this phrase that keeps getting repeated where God says, and I will be their God and they will be my people. And so throughout the whole of the Old Testament, God was trying to create a people, the nation of Israel, who would be his people, who would love him, who would trust him, who would have a relationship with him and talk to him. And he could work with them and through them and they could share his glory, his blessings, his victories, all the great things that he was doing in the world. God is looking for a bride or a people that he can be close to. And that was his plan in the very beginning with Adam and Eve. But because they sinned, a separation occurred between mankind and God. And throughout the Bible, God has been trying to win back mankind to bring us back into a relationship right at the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation in the very last chapters of Revelation it says now the dwelling of God is with man and he will be their God and they will be his people and he will wipe every tear from their eyes God's ultimate plan is to have us close to him when we die and the end of the world comes the bible says there will be the marriage supper of the lamb where his people his church those who love him and whom he loves they they brought together and there's this wonderful marriage celebration where we rejoice and we are united with god forever but throughout the Bible, there are many circumstances where God tried to illustrate this with this idea of covenant. And so when the earth was destroyed by the flood in the early days, when Noah survived with seven members of his family, God says, I found righteous Noah and I'm going to make a covenant with him. And so God destroyed all life on earth except for Noah his family members, and, and two of every animal. And after the flood, God made a covenant with Noah where he says, look at the rainbow in the sky. This covenant reminds me that I will never again destroy the earth by a flood. And it was a covenant where God says, I'm committing. It doesn't matter how bad the world gets. It doesn't matter how disobedient everybody is. I will never again use a flood to destroy the earth. And I'm making a covenant with you, Noah, and then a sacrifice was made, animals were burnt and smoke went up and a covenant was formed where God says, I'm committing to this promise and this relationship. Later on, there was a man called Abraham who God chose out of obscurity. Abraham did not know God, but God chose him and said, I want him to be my friend. And God made a covenant with Abraham where he promised him that he would bless him, that he would make him a blessing to the nations, that he would multiply his descendants and that the whole world would be blessed through him. And God promised land to Abraham, promised descendants and 
proved it with a, a cutting of an animal. And as the blood was shed, God said, this is my covenant to you, Abraham. I'm promising that I will be with you and all these blessings will follow you and I will look after you. And the sign in Abraham's body was he was circumcised and all of his male descendants were circumcised as a way of remembering this covenant relationship where God is promising between himself and Abraham. Then there was Moses where God made a covenant with Moses and the people of Israel. And it was the, the covenant of the law where God said, if you will keep all these laws, I will bless you. But if you don't keep them, then these curses will come upon you. And it was a certain covenant of relationship to keep the nation of Israel safe from the harm of sin, but also to show them their need for the Savior, Jesus, who was going to come, the ultimate covenant God. Uh, Joshua made a covenant when he went into the land of Israel. He'd been told by God to go in and to invade and destroy all the peoples in, in the land of Canaan. And he went in and some people called the Gibeonites came and deceived Joshua. They said, we're from far away. We're not from the land of Canaan. Please, will you make a covenant with us that you will protect us and you will look after us? And the Bible says that Joshua did not consult the Lord, but he made a covenant with these people, the Gibeonites, and God honored that covenant and held him to that covenant. A little while later, the Gibeonites were attacked by some other kings and they cried out to the Israelites. They said, please come and help us. Joshua and the Israelites went and God made the sun stand still in the sky for a whole day so that Joshua could protect the Gibeonites. And then 400 years later, when King David was king of Israel, there was a drought in the land for several years. And David went to God and said, God, why is there a drought? And God said, because somebody is harming the Gibeonites with whom you have a covenant. So 400 years later, God was still looking after and honoring that covenant. King David also made a covenant with a man called Jonathan, who was a friend of his. He was King Saul's son. And the Bible says that Jonathan and David loved each other as their own souls. There was a close friendship and love between them. And they exchanged their belts and their, their swords and their tunics. And they were basically saying, all my protection, all my wealth, everything I have is yours and yours is mine. We will look after each other. We are united in God. And later on, after Jonathan had died, David looked for any descendants of Jonathan's who he could still show blessing and kindness to because he'd made this covenant. Basically, he was saying, because I've covenanted with Jonathan, any of his family are my family. And there was a crippled man called Mephibosheth, who was the last descendant. He was living in a place called Lodabar, which in Hebrew simply means a place called nothing. He was in obscurity. He was fearing for his life and he was crippled. And David took him and made him his own son. And he sat at David's table and ate every meal with David for the rest of his life and lived in the luxury of a king's son because of a covenant that David had made with Jonathan. Are you seeing the power of this thing called covenant, the, the relationship that is supposed to be there? God also says that a husband and wife have made a covenant and they are one in spirit because God is desiring godly offspring. He says that God has made them one in spirit because of a covenant that they have made. So when two people make a covenant, do you remember in Genesis when Adam and Eve were brought together? It says that a man will leave his father and mother. So there's a a leaving of previous relationships. It says he will be united to his wife, which is talking about making a covenant where you promise to honor and love and look after each other and be united. And then it says, and they will become one flesh, which is talking about the physical union of a man and wife. But it also, if you take all three together, means that they are united in spirit, in soul, and in body. In God's eyes, God puts their spirits together and then he puts his spirit and the cord of three strands, husband, wife, and the spirit of God makes an unbreakable bond. And so Jesus later on, when he was questioned, he said, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. This idea of covenant is not like contract. In the human realm, we make a contract with someone and we say, I will do this if you will do that. But in God's eyes, covenant means a spiritual bond has been made. And it's not just a physical agreement between two people, but God binds our spirits together and makes us one 
in the spirit. The Bible says that when we sleep with someone who is not our wives, we are breaking covenant and we are joining ourselves with someone who we shouldn't be joined to. But then the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 17, if anyone unites himself with the Lord, he becomes one spirit with God. Our spirit and God's spirit become one because we've made a covenant. And so the promises that happen in a marriage ceremony in my country, the promises go something like this. I take you to be my lawful wedded wife. I promise to love, honor, cherish you in sickness and in health, for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse, whatever may happen until death parts us. Those are the promises that are made in a wedding covenant or agreement. But those are a picture of the promises that God is longing and desiring for us to make with him. God says, I want you to be my people and to have a relationship with me like a husband and wife. Just as a husband and wife know each other, they love each other, they communicate with each other, they have a great depth of closeness. God says, I want that between me and you. I want to be so close to you. I want us to share our secrets with one, one another. I want us to spend time in each other's presence. And God says, I've made a covenant with you so that you are one spirit with me. When you say to God, Lord, I promise to love you, honor you, cherish you and obey you for richer, for poorer, whatever may come till death brings us together. He says, I make a covenant with you. I put my spirit in you. I make our spirits one. And God says, I will be with you forever. And then we have the marriage supper of the lamb at the end of time, where we're united with Christ and the bridegroom comes and takes us home forever. This idea of covenant is so powerful because God has made promises to us. He's taken his robe, his sword, his belt, his wealth, his protection, even his name, and he's given them all to us. And he said, I give you all of everything that I am, I give to you. And I take everything that you are, all your sin and weakness and shame, I take that upon myself. And that's why when Jesus was on the cross, the blood that he shed was a picture of all those blood covenants in the Old Testament where animals were sacrificed to ratify a covenant. Jesus was dying on his, with his own blood on the cross and saying, I'm ratifying a covenant where I give all that I am to you, my church, my bride. And just like when Adam was put to sleep in the Garden of Eden and God cut open his rib, his side, took a part out of him and made a wife for Adam, Jesus, when he was on the cross, his side was cut open by a spear, blood flowed out, and what was taken out of him made the way for us to be the bride of Christ, to be the church, the, the washed ones, the clean ones who've received all of his goodness, his power, everything that a covenant entails. He's poured it onto us. He's made us his own people. He said, they are mine. They are bought with my blood. Nothing can change that. Nothing can take them away. They will never be taken out of my hand. I love them and they are my people and my bride. And so just as a husband looks after his wife, he gives his name to his wife. He provides for her. He protects her. He guides her. He lives with her and loves her and shows her affection. God does the same with us. We are his bride, his body. He feeds us. He cares for us. The Bible says he washes us with his word and he is our husband and he will never let us go. This is the glorious story of God wanting a wife, wanting to gain a people for himself who will be with him forever. Friend, understand that is God's desire for you. It's not to put a whole lot of rules on you to make your life miserable and to try to punish you. God wants a relationship with a people who will be his bride. And that's what the church is. It's the bride of Christ, the people of God those whom he loves, his own body, who he clothes, cares for, protects, loves, and puts his own name upon. That is the story of covenant. And I'll return in a few moments with some questions and discussion points. So the first question that you can discuss with your group is, how is this idea of covenant different to earthly ideas of contracts or agreements between people? Ask the people to discuss how does a contract work and how is covenant different? And obviously the answer is that it's from God's 
side and it's with God's power and the Spirit of God is involved. So it lasts forever. It has supernatural power. And also God's strength is put into this agreement so that it doesn't just rely on our own ability. But let people discuss that for a few moments. The second important question is, what is a husband and wife relationship like? And is your relationship with God like that? <coughs> Ask people to discuss this and see what they come up with. Try and get some ideas of how our relationship with God can be more like a husband and wife relationship. God bless you as you discuss these things. And I'm trusting and praying that your little group, wherever you live, will become a little church that is the bride of Christ in your area, showing his love and his glory to everybody around. God bless you. Thank you for watching this video. If you would like to know Jesus and know that you are his child, please pray this prayer with me right now. Dear Lord God, I believe in you. I believe in your son, Jesus Christ, that he came to earth, that he lived and died for me and rose again. And I ask you now, Lord, to wash me of my sin and to come and live inside me by your Holy Spirit and to take control of my life. I love you, God, and I will serve you the rest of my life. Come now, Lord Jesus, into my heart. Amen. Well done. If you prayed that prayer, you're a child of God, and God loves you and lives in you. Please visit our website, leadinglightsnetwork.com, for more material and information that will help you grow as a Christian and serve the Lord better. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit leadinglightsnetwork.com for more resources. And if you have been blessed, please consider supporting this ministry financially by making a donation on the giving page at leadinglightsnetwork.com.